Welcome to Wild Bearings Outdoors. I'm Sam Johnson. And I'm Chris Sloan. We're your Wild Bearings Outdoors host, where each episode will take you to one of our favorite watersheds where the history's interesting, the scenery's beautiful, and the fly fishing's amazing. This episode, we're headed into Western North Carolina to the legendary Davidson River. Now this river source is high up in Pisgah National Forest and is listed as one of Trout Unlimited's top 100 trout streams in the United States. The Davidson's home to some great wild trout fishing in its headwaters and down towards its mouth on the French Broad River, some of the best trophy waters in the southeast. And to help us find those big trout, we've invited our friend and professional guide, rod maker and fly tire, Kevin Howe, to fish with us today. Kevin's a lifelong resident of the area and owner of Davidson River Outfitters. It literally sits on the banks of the Davidson. Well, you know, I know Kevin can catch those big pigs in the trophy water he manages, Chris, but can he change gears and sneak up on those little spooky wild trout in the headwaters of the Davidson? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, so we're going to find out. Yeah, we, we, we are going to find out today, and throughout the day, we'll learn about the Davidson's rich watershed history, the Pisgah National Forest, George Vanderbilt's Forestry School, the Blue Ridge Parkway, all about the fish hatchery, and some incredible natural landmarks, and a heck of a lot more. So come along with us on this episode of Wild Bearings Out outdoors as we explore and fish the Davidson River in western North Carolina. Let's do it. great to, to be here on the Davidson River uh, in Pisgah National Forest and uh, and with us is Kevin Howell uh, with Davidson River Outfitters. Uh, Kevin, thanks for um, thanks for fishing with us today. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's always fun to get out of the shop and get to go fishing a little bit. I bet it is. Hey, um, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your background. I mean, uh, how did you get here in Brevard? Pisgah Forest area. So my my father and uncle were were huge um, fly tires and fly fishermen. So they moved here because of the hunting and the fishing opportunities. They moved from Mitchell County, North Carolina, simply because of the fishing. Yeah. And they had a custom fly tying rod building business. Um, they ran from 1970 until 1996 when I closed it down after both of them had passed away. Right. So I ended up here, ended up growing up in a, in a family that fished for a living. They were professional anglers, guides, fly tires. Uh, they were also school teachers. They taught school so they could have all summer free to fish. How did you become affiliated with Davidson River Outfit? In 1994, uh, 95, I was working as an engineer uh, designing houses. Was tired of listening to everybody complain about how much their house cost. The guy who owned the shop at that point in time, Larry Hall, came to my father and said, hey, would you manage the shop for, for me? And my father said no. And I went to Larry and I said, look, I'll manage the shop for you if you let me set the schedule so I can fish with my father on the days that that we think he's gonna feel good. In 1996, I left the construction trades and, and went into being a manager at the shop. And then two years later, I purchased the shop from Larry and, We've been there ever since. I know that you're, you know, a master fly tire, a certified casting instructor. Uh, you've you've uh, been featured in a lot of magazines and TV shows and things like that. A certain degree of fame, I guess, comes with <laughs> your degree of experience. I did it to try and better myself, make myself a better student of the sport and understand more. So, And I'm a firm believer that I don't care how long you fish, um, you're still going to learn stuff every trip I take. If I get to Argentina, first few trips down there, I was like, Wow, I've never seen this technique before, and I've never seen this done. And I learned about, you know, tying flies. What we tie here, it looks really good in the bin. You go down there, and it's literally two pieces of flash and an eyeball on a hook, and yeah. you're still catching fish on it. So you learn that maybe we're 
overdressing our flies a little too much. Or, yeah. or maybe we're selling them to the fishermen and not necessarily the fish. I sent Bruce the fly and I said, Bruce, this is the best fly that's ever been tied. You need to have it in the catalog. Well, Bruce calls me back. I can't put that fly in the catalog. I said, why not? He said, that's the ugliest fly I've ever seen. <laughs> I said, I understand it's ugly. I said, but it catches fish. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter. It's ugly and I can't sell it. You're also an author. I am. Several books. I think you've got another one getting ready to come out or just came out. I have one that just came out. The best flies for the Great Smoky Mountains. Whoa. Oh, National yeah. Park. Features 50 patterns in there. And does it have that really ugly fly? That It does. does. That very ugly fly is featured in there very prominently. Kevin, I know that you're one of the founding members of the North Carolina Outdoor Heritage Council. Tell us a little bit about that. The Outdoor Heritage Council was formed by the North Carolina Legislature in 2016 and our goal was to create a trust fund, establish this trust fund, and use all the money from it to get kids 16 and, mm. and younger back outdoors. Noble call. Yeah. We have managed to grow that trust fund, and this year we're going to spend about three and a half to $5 million um, getting kids outdoors. Oh, wow. I understand there are some state records in the family. <laughs> <laughs> there are some state records in the family. Um, my uncle caught the state record brown trout back in the 70s out of the davidson river four or five months later my father broke it they swapped it back and forth a couple of times yeah. wow yeah. Uh, all out of the davidson here you know the davidson river you know really forms up and flows through the pisgah ranger district which is about 160,000 acres it flows all the way down into pisgah forest it's a freestone stream starts mm -hmm. high up here in the balsams, coming down the Laurel Fork and Daniels Ridge Prong and all those come together to form the Davison. Looking Glass Creek are a big tributary that equal about half the water flow once you're down on the lower end of the valley. 65% of the country can drive here within a day's drive, so it makes it a very accessible wow. stream. And it's really the first real high quality trout stream you hit coming out of Florida, Georgia, yeah. South Carolina vast majority of this stream you got a road within feet of it you can park your car step out of your car and yeah. 10 steps you're in the river we call that assisted living <laughs> <laughs> i'm about ready to finish up breakfast here and go chase some of these fish absolutely yeah, let's, go, let's go up and see what we can find up high that'll be a lot of fun all right Thanks. Storm Fred, did this boulder field exist here? No, this boulder field was not here before Tropical Storm Fred. And as you look up and down the river, you'll see that the banks look really eroded or whatever, and that is all Tropical Storm Fred damage. Just scourged it out. Yeah, it just cleaned the river out top to bottom. But the water is low, the fish are going to be spooky, so longer casts, lighter tippets. I got 6X. I, I, that's usually my go to, is 6X. Well, I'm doing 6X, I mean, because that's. You know, fishing the small streams that I fish most of the time, I mean, that's kind yeah. of what I stick with. The fact of the matter is, the fish aren't supposed to be able to see it anyway. Yeah, they're not supposed to. They're not but supposed I'll tell to. you, if they can pick out a size 28 nymph in that riffle, yeah, they can, they can see, see it.
Whaleback Rock Swimming Hole. It's a huge rock with a split in it that the entire river flows through. So with the lower water we've got today, the fish are, are a lot pickier than usual. Um, super spooky, we got our high blue skies, no cloud cover, so any motion along the edge of the bank and these fish are scattering and spooking out. Fish that pool from where you're at because they're so spooky, you try and wait up there, they just blow out. Cold Creek as it comes into Whaleback Fishing Hole Rock on the Davidson River. And uh, we're getting ready to head back up it, hill off to the right, back to the uh, trucks and meet Chris and Kevin. And then we're gonna head back to the, uh, to the camp, grab some lunch, and then we're gonna go down to the lower Davidson and chase some trophy trout in the trophy area for, the, uh, for Kevin's business. Of the eight fish, seven of them were on it. One of them was on the caddish. But when I got to where y'all were, it was just like nothing since then. That's funny, because we, we couldn't get anything out of that hole. We changed, I don't know how many bugs. I mean, I didn't get anything out of that hole either. And then Kevin well. Kevin put on a, uh, a little mop fly. I was thinking this is going to be unbelievable, and it just stopped. I was thinking y'all were catching them all up here. Well, this Kevin, been, he been getting into them. <laughs> Fishing, Kevin, um, the upper part of the Davidson, I think we had a pretty good morning. Yeah, you know, uh, once you get above the fish hatchery and, and the gorge up there, the fish are definitely going to be smaller. Um, they're more wild uh, little fish, you know, average fish, probably, I don't know, 6 to 10, 12 inches, rainbows, as you saw. And, uh, you know, I really like that area from, from Wales Back Rock on up toward the Daniels Ridge access. That's one of my favorite stretches up in there and a very historic um, area that we're in right now as it comes to forestry. Correct, you know, most, most people don't realize this is where forestry in the United States started, was, was right here. All this property used to be attached to the Biltmore House and to the Vanderbilt Estate. After he passed away, his wife sold what is now Pisgah National Forest to the Forest Service to get out of tax debt. And then he had, uh, you know, a uh, shank, which if you come through here, you'll see Shank Job Corps and Shank this. Shank was the original forester. And he, was from, he was a German, German. trained yep. forester. You know, when you think about George Vanderbilt and, and what he did uh, when he and his mom moved down, you know, to Asheville, and he built that estate. What a lot of people don't know is he went just on the ridge up here and built a big Adirondack lodge up there, Buck Springs. Yep. When Edith finally died. The family went ahead and sold the rest of that property to the National Park Service. They tore it all down, except the spring house, which is still there, and some foundations, and one building that got moved into Asheville in a, a gated community there. The impact of this man on this area, just up the road here, starting the very first forestry school in America, and trained the very first foresters in America right here on the Davidson River where we're, where we're fishing. You know, a lot of that history is still up here, the cradle of forestry. You can go up there and visit the, the old locomotives and visit the, the fine stuff that George had developed and designed and how he managed the forest up there. They have all kinds of exhibits. And then, of course, after him, the very first Civilian Conservation Corps camp in North Carolina was was up at John Rock. It was right here at the base of John Rock. Yeah, right where the almost where the fish hatchery's at today. Yeah, and they they, they did everything from build roads and bridges and trails and and all the right. things it kind of took to really turn this into a really uh, great place to visit today. George Vanderbilt 
so loved Looking Glass Falls, he took a, I think it's a 25 acre boundary and didn't let them cut anything around there. And that's probably what preserved it to where it looks a lot like it does today. It was the first managed forest in America is this property we're, we're sitting on right now. And there's all types of different things you can do. You can backcrunch your camp, you can get off the grid, uh, you can do a little glamping if you need to. Amazing trail systems here. Uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful place. And then skirting the whole thing to the, to the north is the Blue Ridge Parkway. Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, that really showcases the Appalachian chain. The parkway is 469 miles long and runs from Cherokee, North Carolina, all the way to Waynesville, Virginia. Work began by the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1935 and was finally finished in 1987 with the completion of the Linco Viaduct on the backside of Grandfather Mountain. It's intended as a drive a while, stop a while, and enjoy the views and solitude. It's America's longest and most visited national park and a true national treasure. Kevin, you've, you've, you've written several books, Flies for the Great Smoky Mountains. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about your other books. Walker Parrott, who works for me, uh, he and I co-authored uh, 50 Best Places to Fly Fish in the Southeast. Wow, it's a um, great book. We um, took the places we've been and, and guides we knew. And then I've also helped with uh, several other books like The Best Tailwaters in America and Fly Fishing the National Parks. Speaking of fishing, I'm about ready to finish up lunch here and head back out uh, down into the trophy waters that Davidson River Outfitter manages. I do spend a fair amount of time out there and clean it up and, and manage it as a as a private fishery, private access fishery. Who takes better care of the river than someone who has to make a living on that river? That's one of the benefits of, of managed water. Another benefit for us, we saw years ago how, how busy the guiding situation was getting here. When I started guiding, there were 40 licensed guides in the western 23 counties. Now there's about 600. We tried to find a way where we could remove part or all of our guides from the upper Davidson here and not have to contend with 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 additional guides up here on this water. Let's finish up lunch and let's jump out there on that trophy water of yours and see if we can catch a big fish. Okay, sounds great. All right. Get up here and go up those little ripples right there and fish against that bank on the other side. Well, I tell you what, I, I, I love catching wild fish, Kevin, mm -hmm. but it was a real thrill catching some of these big guys on your part of the river. Down. Yeah, it, it's different, you know, um, maybe it's not for everybody, but like you said, hey, I, it's fun to get out there and do it every once in a while. Davidson River Outfitters Managed Water. T tell us about your, your outfitter and, and your, you know, your, your business. Sure, so uh, we're, a, we're a full service fly shop and outfitter. 
Um, I got my start in, in fly tying and rod building. I teach rod building classes every winter. We teach a ton of fly tying classes every winter. We have the largest fly tying selection uh, outside of Little River Outfitters. Byron and I, those two shops, Little River Outfitters and Davidson River, have the best fly tying selections in the southeast. And then we have a full service guide service there. I have 11 guides working out of there. We do wade trips, full and half day. We do float trips for bass, trout, and muskie. And then we do a lot of, of destination travel. We still go to Patagonia a couple times a year. We go to Chile now, Bahamas, Mexico, you name it. You know, I will say that my staff, I have the best staff around. I have guys who have managed operations in Alaska. Um, my senior guide, Walker Parrott, has been with me for 25 years. Go to their website. Uh, they have uh, all the hatches that are going off, recommendations on what to fish, what's hatching that time of the year, what bugs to select. And of course, mm. if you walk into the shop, man, they have one of the best uh, fly selections that you're going to find around. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We, uh, we, we try to be a fly shop and not a clothing store that, that pretends to be a fly <laughs> shop. <so. laughs> well, it was a great day on the river, um, and we just appreciate you taking time out of all the stuff that you're doing uh, to, to spend time with us and show us the Davidson River. I need you to come by more often so I can get out of the shop there more often. <laughs> Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Wild Bearings Outdoors. Chris, it was a great day on the Davidson River here in Western North Carolina. We caught a bunch of wild trout and we caught some trophies too. Man, we sure did. And uh, we learned a lot about the area's history and of course, the natural beauty, you just can't beat it. And we'd really like to thank Kevin Howe of Davidson River Outfitters for fishing with us, showing us how the pros do it. Uh, and uh, I was impressed uh, that he can not only catch a big trout, trophy trout, uh, but he can still find those little wild ones too. Yeah, he sure can. He is a real pro, and I really enjoyed fishing with him. I'm sure you did too. Yeah. And we hope you'll be watching the next episode of Wild Bearings Outdoors when we visit another one of our favorite bucket list locations to chase trout and explore its natural beauty and history. And in the meantime, remember, Trout don't live in ugly places.